Puebla. Thank you all very much for having me. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm actually going to jump right into it. I'm going to start with a film that actually, well, this is considered the greatest ending in the history of cinema. Certainly up there. Sing it, Sam. You must remember this. A kiss is just a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. Because you're getting on that plane. I don't understand. What about you? I'm staying here with him till the plane gets safely away. No, Richard, no. What has happened to you? Last night, Last we, said night a... we said a great many things. You said I was to do the thinking for both of us. Well, I've done a lot of it since then. It all adds up to one thing. You're getting on that plane with Victor where you belong. But Richard, no one... I... Now, but... you've got to listen to me. Do you have any idea what you'd have to look forward to if you stayed here? Nine chances out of ten, we'd both wind up at a concentration camp. Isn't that true, Louis? I'm afraid, Major Strauss, I would insist. You're saying this only to make me go. I'm saying it because it's true. Inside of us, we both know you belong with Victor. You're part of his work, the thing that keeps him going. If that plane leaves the ground and you're not with him, you'll regret it. Yeah. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon and for the rest of your life. But what about us? We'll always have Paris. We didn't have, we, we lost it until you came to Casablanca. We got it back last night. When I said I would never leave you. And you never will. But I've got a job to do too. Where I'm going, you can't follow. What I've got to do, you can't be any part of. Hilda, I'm no good at being noble, but it doesn't take much to see that the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. Someday you'll understand that. Now, now. He's looking at you, kid. Now, no matter how many times you see this movie, you could see it 50 times, but the 51st time, you're thinking it's going to it's going to end differently. They're going to stay together. That's the hope. Always the hope. But they're not going to be together. Because in the 19, early 1940s, and this movie was actually released early so that it could actually be timed with the Allied joint invasion with England of North Africa. This film actually has an important message. One of, well, sacrifice, Sacrifice in the sense that, yes, the most important thing in life is to find the person you really love. But in this moment, even that has to be set aside for a greater cause, for a greater and more important journey that you have to take. Here's looking at you, kid, with something that actually was not even in the script. That was ad-libbed. That was put in by Bogart. He used to play poker. He taught Ingrid Bergman how to play poker uh, during, in between takes. And so it's nice that that little touch is in there. But what I will say is this movie, Casablanca, White House, right? The United States at first didn't want to get involved in what was going on in Europe. That was their problem. And like Rick, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and there is a parallel, eventually has to, well, take a side. He's going to have to get involved. He's going to have to fight. And so this is a really important movie in that lovers can't be together. Our next film is also about lovers who can't be together, but what makes this one so unusual is that it's a comedy. Usually in comedies, comedies end happily. We expect on occasion dramas to be downbeat or tenebrous or, you know, not the most happy ending. Here we're going to get two lovers that aren't going to make it. And there's a little bit of a clue here in the opening of what Woody Allen says, breaking that fourth wall, which he's going to do throughout this film. There's an old joke. Um, two elderly women are at a Catskill Mountain resort, <clears throat> and one of them says, boy, the food at this place is really terrible. The other one says, yeah, I know, and such small portions. Well, that's essentially how I feel about life, full of loneliness and misery and suffering and unhappiness, and it's all over much too quickly. Another important joke for me is one that's uh, usually attributed to Groucho Marx, but I think it appears originally in Freud's wit and its relation to the unconscious. And it goes like this, I'm paraphrasing. Um, I would never want to belong to any club that would have someone like me for a member. So, not wanting to belong to a club that would have someone like himself as a member puts him in a situation like this one. In other words, he doesn't want to date Jewish girls, being Jewish. He actually wants to date wasp girls. 
And so, this is going to be the Easter dinner celebration. Not exactly on a Jewish person's calendar. Oh, yeah. Grammy always does such a good job. <laughs> Great sauce. It is. It's dynamite ham. We went over to the swap pit. Annie, Graham, and I got some nice picture frames. We really had a good time. Anne tells us that you've been seeing a psychiatrist for 15 years. <coughs> yes, I'm making excellent progress. Pretty soon when I lie down on his couch, I won't have to wear the lobster bib. Dwayne and I went out to the boat basin. We were caulking holes all day. Yeah. And Randolph Hunt was drunk, as usual. Oh, that Randolph Hunt. You remember Randy Hunt, Annie? Uh -huh. He was in the choir with you. Oh, yes. I can't believe this family. Annie's mother is really beautiful. And they're talking swap meets and boat basins. And the old lady at the end of the table <clears throat> is a classic Jew hater. And uh, they, they, they really look American, you know, very healthy. They're, like, they never get sick or anything. Nothing like my family. Ah, let him run dead. Who needs his business? His wife has diabetes. Diabetes? Is that an excuse, diabetes? Let me tell you. A man is 50 years old and doesn't have a substantial job. Is that a reason to steal from Oh, yes, that's right. What are you talking about? So the idea that a character wants to have something that really, normally, he wouldn't get, that seems to be the... Well, the calling for Alvy Singer. This film, its original title was Anadonia, the inability to experience pleasure. It had other titles. It had to be Jew, Me and My Goy. Right near the end, they actually settled on Annie Hall. Diane, um, Diane Keaton, in the movie, in real life, her name was Diane Hall. Uh, so it is much more autobiographical than maybe a lot of people even realize. But they are going to talk across the table. They're going to say, what are you doing for the holiday? And the Jewish family is going to say, well, we're atoning for our sins, which is something that the Christian family can't understand at all because their holiday, their Easter celebration is one of rebirth, renewal, and resurrection. But here it sort of classically summarizes, or just in a nutshell, the difference between men and women with a split screen. Once again, Woody Allen deftly on his top of his talent with this film. You know what you're talking about. It's like this dog. Sure, that day in Brooklyn was the last day I remember really having a good you know, we time. We never have any laughs anymore is the I've, problem. I've been moody and dissatisfied. How often do you sleep together? Do you have sex often? Hardly ever, maybe three times a week. Constantly, I'd say three times a week. And that, my friends, is the tragic difference between men and women, right? I mean, tragic for the men is what I'm certainly saying. Uh, all right, now, our next film is one where there are scripts that actually float around Hollywood. They're deemed unfilmable, sometimes because their subject matter might be considered too politically explosive. But there are other scripts that actually are unfilmable because, well, we don't even have the ability technologically to bring this, what this script is calling for to screen. A young maverick filmmaker in the early 1970s was the type of guy in our next film who said, hand me one of those scripts, because the movie I make will prove that that script can be done, and done in a way that will be beyond memorable. The film? Stick your cock up her ass, you motherfucking worthless cocksucker. Be silent. Oh. 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 
1973 was a blockbuster. It was made on the, you know, on the uh, heels of freaking making The French Connection, which was another film that actually was dazzling for its uh, technological virtuoso editing, uh, the car chase uh, following the elevated train uh, with Gene Hackman. This film is an important message, and why? Because if you know the whole story, it's based on a true story. And in this world, the medical community is at their wit's end. They have no idea how to help this young girl. I mean, they thought maybe it was a, something, some kind of an issue where she might have some kind of a tumor near her spine, in her brain. They checked that all out. Nothing physical is wrong with her. So it obviously has to be psychological. But when they actually do psychological tests on her, the psychiatrists are baffled. They're mystified. There's nothing they can do. They've tried several things, nothing works. So, when the medical community lets you down, who do you turn to? Well, in this case, it's this alcoholic young priest who's experiencing a crisis of faith. He doesn't even know if he can continue to be a priest anymore. And this older, right, aging, over-the-hill exorcist who are gonna be the last hope for this young girl. Now. All of us have doctors, and there might even be some doctors in the audience. My father was a, a surgeon in D.C., where this is set. <laughs> um, doctors want to cure us. They want to make sure we're healthy. But I don't know any doctors that are willing to give their lives for their patients. Do you? Not that they should, but they're not willing to sacrifice themselves so that you can be better. Here we have a story of two men, right? Two men that are willing to put their lives on the line to try to make this young girl well. And guess what? If they die trying, ultimately, ultimately, it was worth it. If she can be now no longer possessed by these demons, by this devil. All right. The younger one can't take it, he has to take a break. So the older one goes in by himself to complete the exorcism.
You son of a bitch! <laughs> Come into me! God damn you! Take me! Take me! <laughs> <laughs> So when you ask yourself what really is frightening, right? It is something that actually, well, many of us in this room probably don't believe in ghosts, but there's a chance we do believe in the devil, that the devil exists. And this film really hit close to home. I mean, it is one where people in the 1970s, after seeing this movie, they were scared to go back inside their own bedrooms. A film actually made you afraid in your own home but it was because it was just such a real experience for those that saw it, especially when it first came out. Great performances. Our next film, right? Well, it needs no real introduction. So you want to make, right, a movie about World War II, and you're Steven Spielberg, and what are you going to do? Well, this dog green sector of Omaha Beach during the Normandy invasion on June 6, 1944, was the most ferocious of all the fighting. How ferocious was it? Well, we're going to see in a moment this recreation. It's going to be 28 minutes long in the film, 28 minutes and it was not storyboarded by the director. Steven Spielberg said he wanted that sense of spontaneity, wanting to f figure out where to put the camera in the spirit of the moment, not having it all pre-planned. But it cost $12 million in 1997 to shoot just this sequence. And they actually used 20 to 30 amputees um, to actually look at, you know, to have you sort of experience the, how these men's bodies were shredded by that German machine gun fire. Um, just to give you a little bit of background on the actual numbers, this dog green sector is where the 116th A Regiment of the 29th Infantry Division landed next to a Ranger squad, the second Rangers. Our film is going to focus on the Rangers, but right next to them, the 116th Regiment they, when that trapdoor went down, they experienced 95% casualties in the first minute. They didn't even get a single shot off. They were faced with just a wall of lead that just shredded everybody to pieces. Many of them jumped overboard over the sides, which you're going to see. They actually didn't want to get ensnared in these anti-tanks. Uh, these are anti-tank barricades that Rommel, the German general, had on the beach. Uh, they wanted not to get ensnared in them, so they actually opened their trap doors in pretty deep water that many of the men with so much heavy gear on, they drowned. Now, when this came out in 1998, this film, our, our audience members who had actually had been in either Vietnam or World War II, and there were still plenty that had been on Normandy Beach, still alive, uh, many of them had to exit the theater. They just couldn't take it. Many had to go into counseling because it was so real. Spielberg is obsessed as a director with the terrifying randomness of death. And you cannot experience that feeling any more acutely than in a moment like this. Why was Jaws so, so, so terrifying? Why was that one kid on the raft singled out by the shark? We don't know. There were many people around that kid. The shark 
randomly, it seems, went after one of those swimmers, one of those bathers, and yes, he was, he was killed as the rest are fleeing from the water. The terrifying randomness of death is definitely something Spielberg deals with in a lot of his films. Um, here you're gonna see, get an idea of what it was like to be on board. Those land, Higgins landing crafts. Just so you know, an idea of the Germans, of the 10 infantry divisions and five artillery divisions that they had available to guard the beach, only two infantry divisions and one artillery division was actually at the beach that day. They all, all the rest of them were held in reserve. Rommel wanted everything at the beach. He was already on his way out. He was actually not even there. He was home celebrating his wife's birthday. He'll get, he'll, it'll take him a whole day to get back to the front. But because he was on the way out and he wasn't being listened to, we were able to be ultimately successful with this Normandy invasion. If they had had all those divisions, 10 infantry instead of just two, five artillery with all their panzer tanks instead of just one, imagine what the casualties would have been. This unit lost 1,000 men, the 116th that day, right? And again, that arterial blood, that's what the historians talk about. No one ever captured that the way Spielberg did. Now, our next filmmaker um, is the one that actually all other filmmakers, at least most filmmakers, are measured against. In fact, Steven Spielberg said this filmmaker, his movie, the one we're about to talk about, was his generation's Big Bang. I want you to look in each one of these shots as far as your eye can see, as far as you can see at those distant mountains or whatever the point is in the distance on the horizon, 
where land and sky meet. Now, how many of you would like to walk there? And to walk there with no weapon to protect yourself, no way to carry any water or food, right? You know, you're totally vulnerable to some kind of wild animal, you know, tracking you down, and who knows what you're gonna find when you get out there. So therefore, in a way, when you're a primordial human being, or in this sense, whatever is evolving into what will later become human beings, people, right? That's literally off limits. That's just verboten out there. You can't, can't do it, can't traverse it. It might as well be an astronomical unit. It might as well be like going to Mars. Although we did have a young woman here last year, if you remember, she's gonna be one of the first people to set foot on Mars when we finally get there. But still, will we get there? Incredible challenges just to make that journey happen. So where are human beings during the early days of our, well, ascent. Well, guess what? At the dawn, it's almost the dusk because we're all on our way out. We're gonna be probably, well, survival of the fittest and we're not the fittest. There's another one. Look how far that is. So with all that space, all that immense space, look at how they sleep. It's almost like the three stooges. One wakes up, wakes up the other, they all hit each other, they all get mad. <laughs> so why are they so tucked inside these, these tight spaces? That doesn't make sense. I mean, maybe they're huddling for warmth. Is that what it is? But Kubrick says no for protection, because if they are out in those spaces, they're going to be, well, a meal for this guy. I mean, look at the size of that zebra that it took down. So picking through the carcasses, they're skinny. They can't compete with the other animals. The pigs are actually lower to the ground. They're getting all the grasses before they can get them. They're vegetarians. And it looks like, well, it's just a matter of, well, when they're just gonna go extinct. But then, inspiration. So now, for the first time, with this femur bone, this early primate actually just got rid of the competition for the food source. And now, thinking about it, I can actually eat this that I just killed. Introducing meat into the diet for the first time is going to expand the brain of these early creatures, right? And they're going to evolve much more quickly now. They've learned to use tools. That is the really defining difference between human beings and almost any other species of creature on Earth. There's a few creatures, a few animals, right? A few bees that actually use tools. But tools that make tools that make tools, a three-stage process is needed in order to be considered technology. Only human beings possess technology. And so, this is our rise to technology, Kubrick is suggesting. So he's already struggling to stand on two legs. That area, he's now out in that area that was once forbidden. And he has his weapon so he can protect himself. In fact, he's hunting. He just made a recent kill, and he's now having his lunch. I know you're all pretty hungry for lunch. This is really going to make you hungry, right? Mm -mm. All right. So another very important resource is water. Well, now already, our team, <laughs> the future humans, 
they're actually on two legs because they have to be able to wield their tools. The others are still down on all fours. Who's going to win this battle? So, when we finally discover tools, what do we do with them? We commit murder. That's what humans, well, that's what we're so good at. You just saw it in Saving Private Ryan. I mean, look at that implementation of technology for mass death that we're so, so efficient at performing against other human beings. So, in a moment of, of real passion, this creature throws his bone into the air, and what you're about to see is one of the most famous match cuts in the history of cinema, because the bone is going to transform into something else. But it's actually still going to look like itself. The bone, I want to remind you, once belonged to something that was alive. It's organic. It is going up. It's ascending. It is actually thrown in a moment of passion, and it is right in broad daylight. Look what happens to it. Because this is, Kubrick is suggesting, this shot is our, well, this is our evolution in technology. And look how deftly he pulls this off. So still white, still looks like a bone, but now it's a spaceship. And now this spaceship can actually go into those forbidden zones, right? Outer space. I mean, once upon a time, you just looked at the moon. Wouldn't it be nice to get there? How will we ever get there? You can't go to the moon. But now that we've created the technology to build the rockets, we're able to actually conquer that distance of 238,000 miles, and we're able to now look further, okay? But the whole time that we're doing it, when we're inside that rocket, we're dependent on the technology to survive. If anything goes wrong with those life support systems, when you're inside the capsule out in outer space, you're dead. So that what we have done, this movie is suggesting, is we've created a world for ourselves where our technology totally dominates our lives. It dominates your life. You're always looking at your cell phone. You're always answering you know, to your computer emails. Everybody, we say, oh, well, instead of answering our devices, we answer to our devices. We have a strange relationship with this technology. It's almost, well, beyond melodramatic. If your cell phone battery goes low, what do you say? My cell phone battery went low. No, you don't say that. You say, my cell phone died, right? And if your computer is not functioning properly, you don't say, well, you know, my computer isn't working. You get all upset because if it's not working, I can't do anything. I just can't function. You say that it has a virus or it crashed. Either way, we got to get this computer to the emergency room as soon as possible, right, to get it fixed. So you see, this film, which I mean looks like it's a movie obviously about science fiction, it's really about our lives even in 1968 and how they were being taken over, controlled. Our humanity is being emptied by the machines that we're investing so much time and effort into. And they are actually, strangely enough, sometimes becoming more human and behaving in a more human fashion than we do. If you look at any Tickle Me Elmo, do you know who Tickle Me Elmo is? Do you know who that is? That little doll has about 10 times more personality than your average five-year-old kid, I guarantee you. And it's a toy, right? Okay, so. Hello. How are you, Squirt? Uh, what are you doing? Pain. Where's Mummy? Gone to shopping. Oh, who's taking care of you? Rachel. May I speak to Rachel, please? She's gone to the bathroom. Are you coming to my party tomorrow? I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I can't. Why not? Well, you know, Daddy's traveling. Very sorry about it, but I just can't. I'm going to send you a very nice present, though. All right. Anything special that you want? Yes. What? A telephone. We got lots of telephones already. 
Listen, sweetheart, I want you to tell Mommy something for me. Will you remember? Yeah. Well, tell Mommy that I telephoned, okay? Yeah. And that I'll try to telephone again tomorrow. Now, will you tell her that? Yeah. Now, how many times was the word telephone mentioned in that telephone call? Many, many times. In fact, all they can do during this telephone call is talk about the telephone that is making the call possible, right? Isn't that ironic? And when she says, what I want for my birthday is a new telephone, he doesn't get that, well, the only time she sees her dad is over this telephone. She really wants her dad. He's clueless. But again, the idea that we can actually speak from Earth to interstellar space, and all we can actually communicate about is the mechanism of the communication itself, says that it's like, instead of opening up our communication, capacity, instead of giving us more options to communicate, it's actually this technology is shutting it down. This was mentioned so eloquently in our first lecture today. Now, the past repeats itself. In fact, it repeats itself right here. Stanley Kubrick studied Nietzsche. He only, he's not university trained formally. He took a night course at CCNY, City College in New York. He was mainly a professional photographer who transitioned into filmmaking. In this course, it was a philosophy class, and he became obsessed with the works of Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche's all about the eternal recurrence of the past. If you look at all Kubrick films, every one of them, there is always a return to the point of origin. Always a return to the point of origin. So, that is your water hole, everybody, in the modern context. The chairs they're sitting on look like the rocks that they were all, all lounging on earlier. Instead of water, well, their, water is in, their liquid is in glasses on top of the round table. And instead of brown fur, he's in a brown suit. Well, how is Gregor? Oh, he's fine. He's been doing some underwater research in the Baltic, so uh, I'm afraid we don't get a chance to see very much of each other these days. <laughs> well, when you do see him, be sure to give him my regards. Huh? Yes, of course. Right. Her husband's at the bottom of the Baltic. She's way up in space. They couldn't be further away from each other but yet they could actually still have a baby. Because our, techni our technology has made it possible for such a total erosion of intimacy, we don't even have to be in the same room with the person that we actually have a child with. Amazing. We don't get to see much of each other these days. Huh. All right. So, we all have to do our biological functions. It's just something humans do. But because we're in space, look at how it constipates us. Look how it frustrates us. You know, if you have to go to the bathroom, you don't have to read War and Peace, the Ten Commandments on how to go to the bathroom. But you've got to follow those rules, otherwise it's going to be, there's going to be trouble here. So this movie should make you think of your life. And I know I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm actually, I have more to say about Stanley Kubrick. Obviously, Hal is a machine that takes over. The reason he takes over is because, well, I have to kill in Hal's m mind. He has to kill the biggest threat to his survival. And the biggest threat to Hal's supercomputer survival would be a human because a human has the ability to shut him off. So Hal actually murders everyone on board. Um, notice how in the future, they're all, instead of the the tight caves, remember the tight cavernous caverns in the caves? Well, now look at how tight they are in this beautiful, immense universe of space. They're actually this claustrophobic. Wow. And of course, the food in the future is not so great either. I mean, we were eating crap back when we were in our primordial days, and we're eating crap now. And you're saying, well, those guys are in space, Mark. That's why they have to eat that stuff. Okay. And I want you to look him at, as he takes this meal out of the microwave. Good evening. Three weeks ago, the American spacecraft Discovery One left on its half billion mile voyage to Jupiter. This marked the first manned attempt to reach this distant planet. Earlier this afternoon, the World Tonight recorded an... So he burned himself. How many of you used a microwave and you burned yourself taking something out? 
Let me see some hands, right? It happens. Okay. First of all, I want to ask you a question. Why are you eating anything out of a microwave? And you're not a spaceman, right? That was designed for these guys. Why do you do it? Well, Mark, you know, I'm very busy. Oh, okay. So in other words, you have this big kitchen. You know, Americans love their kitchens. They usually have miles of granite inside these kitchens, the counters. I mean, you could actually feed a whole army if you wanted to because there's so much prep area. They have giant sub-zero refrigerators. They've got these six gas jet stoves. They have warming ovens and everything else. But what do they use the most in that big kitchen? The microwave. And what do they do in the microwave? They just reheat stuff that's already been made somewhere else. A pizza that we had left over from, you know, Pizza Hut or someplace, horrible. And those microwave meals, I don't know if you have Stouffer's here or whatever you eat, you know, that's your famous. When we make those meals, what do we do? We actually sometimes say, you know, I don't feel like taking it out of its container and putting it on a plate. I'll have to wash the plate. So you actually just eat it out of the little plastic tub that it comes in. Now getting to Paz's, you know, thing about plastic, that's not good. You shouldn't be eating with plastic forks out of plastic. And then you add more plastic to the, to the environment. But this is what we do. This movie is suggesting that human beings are already spacemen in a certain capacity. We've already let technology take over our lives. It's as if everything out there is a hostile environment, and only our technology is something that we can rely on. So with that said, yes, Hal, we'll kill everybody. The sixth man... and I'll flatline all of them. This mission is too important for me to allow you to jeopardize it. So when our machines get to the point where they determine that what we're doing is too much of a risk, too much of a threat to what this machine is really, well, ultimately programmed to do, well, we are gonna have that world of the Terminator, right, where Skynet does try to take over, the world of James Cameron. All right, for just my last film, I'll give you a taste of it. Since Martin Scorsese's been mentioned, we got it. And now, from New York, the Jerry Langford Show. And now, say hello to Jerry. A pleasant good evening to you. You look like a great audience. Louis, yeah. how are you? Lou Brown, ladies and gentlemen, and the uh, marvelous Langford Orchestra. Ruth, Ruth. Uh, and Ed, how are you tonight? Uh, very well, Jerry. Wonderful. I'm sorry I woke you. <laughs> sure. Now, if Martin Scorsese's film or films are about anything, they're about obsession. Whether it's Raging Bull, whether it's Goodfellas, whether it's this movie. And in this film, it's going to examine fan obsession. So much so that he not only adores Jerry Langford, Robert De Niro's Rupert Pupkin character, but he actually has to replace him. He has to become him. He doesn't realize that fame is something that, well, should be earned the hard way with hard work, with talent, with nurturing that talent, with developing that talent, and then sharing it with the world. But you see, what Rupert represents, which is so ahead of its time, is the guy that says, you know, I want a shortcut. I'm gonna do something really outrageous, and that's gonna make, sorry, and that's gonna make, uh, I'm gonna do something super outrageous, and that's gonna make the world notice me. And so what is reality programming all about? What are all these reality shows about? These people, for the most part, have zero. I mean, I don't even know what the Kardashians do. I just know that somehow they're, they're famous. 
and they're famous for being famous. So here you've got... What does that shot look like? Well, that's Robert De Niro, right, who's pulled Jerry Langford out of, the, out of the limousine where he's being attacked by a really crazy fan, obsessive fan, and it looks like he's actually on the other side of the television screen. She lo it looks like she's putting her hands up to the screen because those people on that screen are the ones that, oh, I just want to be with them, I want to be like them, I want to be one of them. And so he's going to talk to Jerry. I just want to tell you, Jerry, my name is Rupert Pupkin, and uh, I know the name doesn't mean very much to you, but it means an awful lot to me. Uh, Billy, calm down. Calm, calm down. down. I'm Take nervous. your time. I'm nervous. Uh, uh, you might have wondered who I am. I've been outside your show many, many times. And, uh, well, you know, I'm in communications right now, but by nature, and this is the point I'm trying to make, by nature, I'm a comedian, you know? No, no, I know what you're going to say. I don't know another one. But I'm, uh, believe me, Jerry, I'm very good. I'm really good. I'm dynamite. And I wouldn't go through this. I wouldn't take one minute of your time if I wasn't absolutely convinced that I'm dynamite. I, I study everything that you ever did. I study the way you built your one line. It's nice and relaxed. How you delivered the, the jokes without leaning too much on them. How you, how you didn't say, hey, Folks, here's the punchline. You know, was, you know, Jerry. You know, you know what I'm talking about. You don't say, folks. Here's the punchline. You just do the punchline. Exactly. That's what I loved about what you did. So what I'm trying to say is that, you see, now I'm ready. I'm ready, and I and I and I've finished the course. And, and I'm sit and I'm thinking as I'm sitting here now. Well, maybe this is my big break. This is my big chance. You know what I mean? What do you think? Look, what'd you say your name was? Rupert. My name is Rupert Puffman. All right, look, pal. I gotta tell you, this is a crazy business, but it's not unlike any other business. There yeah. are ground rules. And you don't just walk on to a network show without experience. Now, I know it's an old hackneyed expression, but it happens to be the truth. You've got to start at the bottom. I know. That's where I am, at the bottom. That's a perfect place to start. I know that, but I'm not... There's got to yeah, be a... But looks so simple to the viewer at home, yeah, yeah. those things that come so easily, that are so relaxed, and look like it's a matter of just taking another breath. It takes years and years and years of honing that and working it. And there's the only one problem, I don't, mean to, I'm not, I don't mean to interrupt you, but there's only one problem, I'm 34 years old. <laughs> okay, so what he's gonna do, he's gonna abduct Jerry, he's gonna tie him up, he's gonna tell them if they don't put him on The Tonight Show and let him do his routine, right, he's gonna kill him, have him killed. So they put him on, and all he does is talk about his life. And everybody starts laughing. But all he's talking about, literally, is his life. And he gets the biggest laugh when he says, Jerry wishes he could be here tonight, but he's, he's tied up. But he is literally tied up. And then he says some other things about Jerry, and they laugh even louder. So in a way, he's not really funny. All he is is someone who is taking his sad life, relaying it to others, and they laugh at it. And so, as a reality star, this was way before that whole wave where you do something really outrageous, you'll become famous, and in a way that's more important than being talented to become known for what you do. Thank you all very much. Thank you.